but I'm going to get straight into it so that we you know, can do as much as we can. Um, I'm based at the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex University. A lot of the work that I do now is in an international context, but actually I've been there six years and much of the work that um, sort of led into that was in a UK domestic context. So, um, I mean, action research can be used in all sorts of contexts. I'm not going to go too far into the history of action research because there's a lot of history and a lot of the early thinking started in the 50s um, and there's been huge developments since then. So I'm going to talk quite a lot about concepts, the key under, underpinning principles, and then give some examples. The examples are going to be mostly around my work, so there's a whole terrain of other sorts of work which I can point you to later. Okay. Um, I think probably the first thing to say is that um, action research really fits within a tradition of participatory research. I mean, and there are multiple participatory research approaches, um, you know, which range from participatory statistics to uh, collective analysis processes to participatory network mapping, all sorts of stuff out there. Um, action research is one piece of that. Um, and I want really then to take you through, well, what does that, what does that actually mean and what does that actually look like? Um, a starting point is... I think this is quite a nice quote. It comes from quite a recent text on participatory action research in health systems. Um, but it essentially, it's saying that what we're really trying to do is change the world. <laughs> it's just something simple. <laughs> but, you know, to change the world around us. We're not just doing research for the sake of it. We're not um, trying to understand something just for intellectual reasons. We're trying to understand it so that we can change things. And, it cut, and action research fits within very much a, an emancipatory tradition of research. And in this sort of research, we don't have research subjects in the same way. And that raises all sorts of questions about ethics, for example, because it's about co-researching and about co-designing and about um, researching together, rather than we are the academics <coughs> in the university and we're researching you, which is what a lot of research is about. Um, so, you know, a lot of the key features of research are, are well, these are just a few, but I'll, I'll just start with those. So the first is learning and action. So if you're like a young person, maybe you're 15 or 16, and you're trying to figure out about, well, what does love mean? What does love mean? Well, you could read the secondary literature, you could uh, read the magazines, you could go on the internet and figure it out. You could do a big survey of you know, all people have had all sorts of relationships segregated by sexuality, gender, whatever it, else it is. Um, or you could just go out and meet people, um, look into their eyes, have dinner, hold their hand, walk in the park. Um, and in, in, in action research, that's how we learn, right? We learn by doing. We learn by experiencing. That isn't to say that that other knowledge isn't useful knowledge, and that actually may help to contextualize our experience. But if we want to make a change in the world or in our own life, we actually have to do it, and we have to learn from it. And action research, in, in many respects, is a structured way of doing that, of learning from action, rather than just learning from an, an inter intellectual analysis. So as I've mentioned, um, action research is about co-researching. If we're, I'm not just talking about my love life now, I'm talking about a collective endeavour, we're collectively learning about research methods in this room, then it's not just a participatory process, it's not just about me telling you or me extracting information from you about what you know about research methods, it's about us collectively opening up an inquiry and exploring what's important to us um, and exploring the different issues that each of us raise, exploring our experiences, contesting each other's positions in order to be able to produce some meaning and some understanding. Um, as I say, it's also about explicitly about creating change. Um, it's very much about the emotional as well as the rational and the logical. Um, and a lot of my work is, very, is uh, rooted in complexity theory and in systems thinking. Um, and, and is very much about understanding how change happens, and how change happens is very often not linear, uh, and very much how research methods are done in, in almost every methodology is very, very linear. You know, if we, if we do this, it will result in that. If we do this, it will result in that. 
And actually, the real world's not like that. The real world is much more messy, much more mixed with emotion, rationality, um, accident, all sorts of stuff comes in there. Um, but the other key part of it is it is about it's an iterative learning process. Well, very often when we research, I mean, it's quite interesting talking about diaries because in some ways diaries are also iterative. They're about trying to find out what's going on sort of over time as things evolve. But action research is very much about saying, if we are here as a group or I am here as an individual, I take an action, I take a step, and when I'm here, the world looks different. So now I have to reassess. I have to, to reassess my methods. I need to reassess my direction. I need to reassess the data that is now in front of me as I stand here, as opposed to what I could see here. Because what I can see there is different to what I could see here. So it's much more about a step-by-step -step process where we learn as we go, um, rather than we learn at the end of a process. So a typical action research cycle very, very common model is this often constructed as circle, is that we, we collectively reflect on the issue that we're engaging with. What's going on? What, what knowledge do we have? What is our personal knowledge? What is the external knowledge? We create some sort of plan of action in relationship to the issue because we're looking for solutions um, and we're looking to learn from the solutions that we generate. We observe, um, we act on that, on that plan and then we observe what happens. Once we know what's happened, then we reflect again. Um, in my work, I've added a fifth element to that, which is ar around theories of change. So in effect, where you start with that reflection, which is an analysis of your situation, then you generate theories of change. What do we actually think is going on here? If we did this, this would happen. If we did this, maybe this would happen. Let's try it out. What are we going to do? Let's do it. Now let's see what happens. So the research is in, now let's see what happens. What can we learn from that? What do we need to, to what, how do we need to recalibrate that? We need to analyze the situation again. How did that impact on the bigger situation? Now, do we need to generate new theories of change? So the, the cycle of research goes round and round. It's not one static process. Um, let me take a step back. Um, there are, I mean, lots of ways to cut different forms of action research. Um, one way, is really about who, the, who is the focus of that co-inquiry. So on the top level, you could say the focus of that co-inquiry is, is me and my multiple selves, if you like. I mean, I'm trying to learn from myself, and there's a whole tradition of reflective practice, which actually in many ways is a form of action research, and some of you will have come across that, right? But the things like action learning are also very similar, because even though they happen in a group situation, they're essentially about learning for the individual. Yeah. So I bring my stuff and my, my debates and, and concerns into a group, the group reflects, and then I go back and I do my stuff again. The second one, and there's a very, very long tradition here, is, a, is various forms of cooperative inquiry. I use that phrase, it captures about 19 different methodologies, from appreciative inquiry to cooperative inquiry, to all sorts of stuff, right? But it's basically focused on the group. A group of people are interested in um, how can we improve the, the litter situation in our local street? Or how, how are we going to deal with um, you know, slavery in this neighborhood that we're, in, we're, we're living in, or whatever it might be? Yeah. They come together, they work as a group, they learn together, um, they gather the data they need, they analyze the data they need, they take action. The third level is a community level. And, and here is a whole other tradition of action research, um, which comes under the sort of heading of participatory action research, very much rooted in the Latin American tradition where knowledge, knowledge is brought together, knowledge is power, knowledge helps us as a community to challenge the oppression that we face. But the focus is on the community and with all of the riders and problems that community-based research has about the fact that you know, communities are often very differentiated <coughs> and that a, a focus on community can often exclude disabled people, women and others in the community but nevertheless a very, very strong tradition. And then the fourth one is the area which I've spent much of my time working on, which is what we call systemic action research, and which is about trying to understand how systems work. And by systems, I don't mean lots of institutions that are connected. I mean that issues are systemically connected. So 
to take an example, a couple of simple examples. Um, if you were looking at education, um, and you were doing a piece of research on education, and you evaluated the success of that education for young girls in, in primary schools in Uganda or Ethiopia or Myanmar or whatever it is, you may produce some very positive conclusions about the education that they get and therefore perhaps the effectiveness of an international development intervention or the money that is spent by some form of international development agency. But if you don't take into account that every 14-year-old girl is going to get married at 14, um, you're not really understanding the bigger picture in which that education is, is situated. And to understand the impact of that intervention, you have to understand the wider picture. Um, and the same would go, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, um, for some of the work that we've we've been doing on slavery. Um, we're looking to understand the patterns and the dynamics that are happening, not just the thing. So um, I'm not going to go into this method because it's another method <laughs> that goes with this, but just to give you an example of what I mean by a system dynamic. We uncover through an analysis of something like um, 300 um, narratives with local NGOs and uh, slaves and people that are, are living in um, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, um, a pattern. And the pattern is something like this, right? Um, you're living in a village. Uh, you have no money because you're a slave. Slaves don't have disposable income, right? So you've got maybe enough to eat, maybe not, right? You, you, you have a health crisis. Whatever the health crisis is, um, you have to borrow money. You can't borrow money from a bank or from a self-help uh, group, so you have to borrow it from the middleman. The middleman will sell you that money at 120% interest. Right? You've got no money to pay that back. The only way you can pay it back is to sell your child into the city. Right? You sell your child into the city, they go and work in a tea shop or a bangle factory or whatever it is, and they get ill. Right? Then you have to borrow more money. And then you send your second child into the city. Right? Now that's a pattern, that's a system dynamic which just repeats itself round and round and round. So when we're looking at systemic action research, we're looking at how you can disrupt that systemic pattern in order to be able to create change. So in order to do that, we have to be able to see the system. And that has major implications for the research methodology because you have to be able to work across the whole system rather than just working in one group. Yeah? So it's just an example. <laughs> I'm not going to stop with these just because I want to get through lots of stuff. <laughs> okay, one of the things I want to say is that we should see action research almost like as a meta-methodology, which is a holding methodology. It's like a learning architecture or a research architecture into which multiple methods might be used. We can use diary methods within an action research context. You know, we can use participatory video, we can use dialogic processes, we can use future search, we've used participatory statistics, because all of this is about generating data, right? And in an action research frame, we don't say, well, like, we're going to use this method, we're going to say, once we've taken this step here and we know where we are, now we need to figure out what we need to know, and then we need to figure out what method we need to get what it is that we need to know. What we've got to here, we actually might need a completely different so it's very much about attuning the method to what it is that you're trying to find out. Um, and as I say, we might need to use any of those things. If you're working in South Africa in a slum area and you're looking at um, security issues, you might want to use a, a mapping technology to look at where all the violent incidents happen. Right? And then once you've got that, you've got the basis on which to have a dialogue about how you might change that and what you need to do about it. But equally, you might want to use a survey, but you might decide actually in dialogue that a survey is actually not going to get you the data you need. So the method, in terms of literally research method, is not the critical issue. It's, a, it's, the, it's the architecture that holds the methods that is what's, what's critical. Um, and I sort of just give you a sort of a representation of that here. So if you think about action research as an extended process of meetings punctuated by action, right? So those little black circles would be meetings. So they could be a meeting of a group that is dealing with 
that issue. For example, I was just discussing about health loans and their relationship to slavery, right? And then, in the first, after the first meeting, um, there's some action. But usually after the first meeting, the action is, well, actually, we don't have all the people we need to, to deal with this issue. Or we don't have the knowledge or the data we need, so let's go out and get some more stories. Or let's go and do a participatory video exercise. Or let's go and do whatever it is. And then we come back to the second meeting and we see where we're at, right? And then we still haven't quite got everything we need, and you know we're beginning to shape towards an analysis, but we actually need a bit more data, so we're going to get some more, and we'll get some more people in, and then we get to the third meeting. This might be, say, six weeks apart, or a month apart, or whatever, whatever the group feels that it needs. And then here you start to get to action. right? So what is it we're actually going to do? And so there's a constant interplay between action and the evaluation <coughs> of action and then what do we need to do next? And it takes you around that cycle that we described earlier. So this is a, this is a large scale process. I'm not going to go into this here, but just to illustrate that when you're doing large scale <coughs> systemic work, you might have multiple inquiry streams. So in the slavery work that we're doing, we've got 24 parallel inquiry streams running for 18 months. Um, five of them, you can see these are centered around five local NGOs. Five of them are dealing with this issue of illness and loans, but others are dealing with a whole series of other things. And they have their meetings punctuated by action, and at certain times they come together and then learn from each other, and they go back into their own action research groups. And so over time, they generate solutions on the ground, and they start to learn, learn from what they're doing, but also there is a big collective knowledge that gets generated. Again, I won't go into the details, but it gives you an idea that you can work at a very local level, but you can also take this to scale. And a lot of what I've been interested in over the last 10 years is how do you build participatory methods at scale, because they're often seen as very localized and anecdotal, and that makes it much more difficult to challenge some of the dominant methodologies like RCTs and so on. Whereas we've now got the methodological expertise to do this stuff on a very large scale. Um, in reality, these sorts of processes look a bit like that. <laughs> um, we're just talking, sitting, discussing, people are working on the, gr on the ground with, it, with each other. Um, one thing I would say which is really important, and it, and it links into participatory research, is that our assumption is that anybody can do participatory research. We work with uh, uh, blind people in our work on disabilities who are also producing system maps. Um, people who have no literacy whatsoever, who are producing brilliant, comprehensive analysis of their situation. Um, our assumption is that everybody can do it, um, and that the people who are the experts are the people that live this, not the people that come from outside. And I've never found a situation where that was not possible. Um, I'm just going to flip through this. I'm just going to end, actually, by just talking to you a little bit about one project in Myanmar. and see if I can do this in a few minutes. Um, we're doing, I've been doing some work in Myanmar um, in Kachin, in the very north on the Chinese border, around the peace process. And we worked with the Rania Civil Society Network, which is like groups of farmers groups, women's groups, religious groups, and so on, um, working with their communities. Um, they collected multiple narratives, and so we're using a life story to, uh, approach where you, you collect, in the slavery case, it was up to 300 narratives for the locality. Here it's about 100. And within the neighborhoods, then, they collect the narratives about their experiences of war, about their experiences of what's happened after the war, about the refugee camps, about, you know, what the issues are. And out of those narratives, they build system maps. And the system maps are like causal maps which say this leads to that and that's leading to this and that one feeds back on this in the way that I was talking to you a bit with that mini example of the, the children going into the cities. But these are maps that are the size of this wall, literally the whole of this wall, which uh, 20 or 30 people are, are drawing on and making the linkages and dialoguing as they go. Right? So they produce this map from all of these stories and out of that map they discern what it is that they want to work on. So in Kachin, they decided that they wanted to work on, on drugs because they had seen through the stories how the drugs were feeding the, the conflict. 
They wanted to work on the relationships between the IDP camps, internally displaced people, and their host communities. And they wanted to look at the issues about resettlement in a context where you've got the second highest level of, of landmines um, in the world, and in the drug context, is the second highest level of opium production after Afghanistan in the world. So they're setting up their action research groups to investigate these things. Um, and I'm just going to give you a flavor of what they did. Um, one of the things they did was straight away was to create a multi-stakeholder groups locally. So, you know, you've got a context in which in some schools they got 50 to 70 percent of heroin addicts. Um, so they got the kids from those schools in. They got the dispensers, um, who, you know, who are dispensing some of the drugs f from across the school. They got the, uh, the, the people who manage the correctional facilities, if you like, where people who are dealing with drugs get put. Got people from the Kachin Independence Army and the Kachin Independence Organization that control the region. Um, they got teachers, they got all sorts of people, and they wrote the guidance on drugs together. So it was like a new curriculum for the schools, which was collectively written, and that's it. That was a product. Now they're going to te they take it into the schools and they'll test it. The action research is both creating it and testing it. See what happens. How does it need to change? How does it need to evolve? Um, and another um, example, which was, uh, oh, well, there's some things up here, but, but which was more organic, was that they decided that through their analysis that the critical link in terms of host relationships and IDP counts was the youth. So they created a process where they brought some of these together to dialogue some of the issues that were emerging on the ground. And that spawned an explosion of energy so that within months, new youth groups started popping up across the whole of Kachin. Um, and those youth groups are now starting to think of, to, to, to connect to the Kachin Independence <coughs> Army, feed knowledge in, open up new spaces for dialogue, and then, and then in a sense, are laying the foundations to feed into a peace process, which is actually quite complex. And much as we think that um, the sort of the new regime with Aung San Suu Kyi and so on is leading to peace, actually, at least eight out of the 16 main armed protagonists aren't even in that peace process. And this 50-year civil war, which has gone on between the main Burmese majority and the Kachin Independence Army, um, is actually in many ways as heightened as it ever has been before. So these sorts of ground level initiatives become very powerful. Um, and I suppose what I wanted to leave you with is that <coughs> action research is a change methodology. That it's research that can contribute to something real and make a difference in the world. Whether that's your practice on a, on a ward in a hospital, um, whether it's you know, slavery writ large across northern India, or whether it's a conflict situation. But what's critical is that um, the data that is gathered is gathered by the people that have a stake in the issue, is analyzed by the people that have a stake in the issue, and the solutions that are constructed are constructed by them and enacted by them, alongside all of the other people that they see needing to be involved in the process. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, it really is a bit of a taster. <laughs> but I hope a useful one. Just on the, the resources, I mean, these are a few of mine. Um, the other one, and that, that's, that one's got quite a lot on action research in an international development context. If you want a really big overview, uh, it costs a lot, but it's really worth it, is um, Hilary Bradbury and Peter Reason's Handbook of Action Research. Um, and if you want specialist ones, we do have a, a website at IDS, uh, which if you just type in IDS and then participatory methods, there's a participatory methods website which will give you pretty much all the resources that you need or directions to the resources that you need across the spectrum of participatory research but also specifically around action research.